Starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kendall Trump with Grain Journal Magazine in Decatur, Illinois. Welcome to Silo Fires and Smolders, Causes and Detection. This is the first in a series of webinars to be presented by Jeeps and Grain Journal Magazine in 2018. Elevator operators need to understand the causes of silo fires and smolders and how abnormal conditions can be detected. Not having this knowledge can result in injuries and business losses. Today's webinar discusses main causes of silo fires and smolders, including grain quality management problems, mechanical and electrical causes, and incidental or outside causes such as poorly executed hot work, cigarette smoking, malfunctioning vehicles, and lightning strikes. Our webinar today will also cover tools available for detecting and monitoring problems, including temperature cables, humidity sensors, CO2 monitors, and various types of equipment performance sensors. Today's webinar is a preview of a lecture from the brand new Jeeps 546 Silo Fires and Smolders course. Jeeps 546 runs March 19th through April 20th, 2018. Registration is open February 13th, that's today, and Mar through March 13th at jeeps.com. Also, join us for Jeeps Exchange 2018 in Denver, Colorado, March 24th through the 27th. Today's webinar is sponsored by M&M Specialty Services, who specialize in protecting your people with the best in quality and affordability in personal protection products from head to toe and beyond. They are based in Lansing, Kansas. Our webinar is also sponsored by, by VAA LLC, who have served the agribusiness industry since its founding in 1978 by providing engineering services in bulk commodity handling facilities, including material handling, value-added processes, transportation, and export. They are based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. To, this webinar has been approved for one-tenth of an of a continuing education unit or CEU. If you already hold a credential with Jeeps in K-State, you are welcome to participate in this webinar, complete a short assessment, and earn one-tenth of a CEU towards the ma maintenance of your credential. For more information or to receive the quiz link, please email Katya at katya at jeeps.com. Our presenter today is Bob Horvat. Bob is employed by Cargill and based in their Minneapolis, Minnesota headquarters. He is a senior engineer for Cargill's North American grain and processing business. Bob holds a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of North Dakota and is a licensed professional engineer. Prior to joining Cargill, he worked in various construction and consulting engineering roles. He is the former president of the Jeeps Minneapolis chapter and currently serves as chapter treasurer. P Please feel free to ask questions today by typing them into the questions box at the right-hand side of your screen at any time during your, today's webinar. We will be answering your questions during a Q&A session following the presentation. We do have one polling question today. How many people are viewing at your location? Thank you for your participation. As a note, today's webinar is being recorded and it will be posted to our website, grainnet.com, within 24 hours. All registrants will also receive an email with a link to the recording the day following the presentation. At this point, Bob, can you please do a voice check? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you perfectly. Hello? Uh, can you please show us okay, your great. opening slide? Ladies and gentlemen, here is Bob Horvat. Okay, great. Let me get this. I don't think they can see the control panel, can you, on the webinar? No, they cannot okay. see the control panel. 
Okay, thanks, Kendall. <clears throat> okay, well, welcome everybody. Thank you for, for spending some time this afternoon um, to uh, to view this course. Uh, like, like Kendall mentioned, um, I've been part of a, a small team uh, in Jeeps developing this, this new course on bin fires and smolders. It's uh, titled Jeeps 546. And today I'll be presenting uh, lecture four from that, that program. And the title of it is Causes and Detections. Causes and Detection. OK. Uh, as, as Kendall also mentioned, I'm, I'm a project engineer here here at Cargill and you know in my current current role I frequently get involved with with equipment and silo failures which uh, at times will include a, a fire or a smolder in uh, in this uh, this particular lecture we'll be talking about causes and detection of grain bin fires and smolders uh, for uh, example what are the causes and how to de detect fires or smolders or related potential problems Um, keep in mind, we're going to we're going to see some pictures here as we go along of of uh, uh, you know burned up equipment or damaged equipment, and and this is all educational material. We're not trying to uh, endorse a particular pro product or 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 uh, um, point out any problems with with different products. Uh, oftentimes, these failures or problems really develop from misuse. Of the product or materials, rather than than actual than an actual defect. So just keep that in mind as as we go along. Before we get into the the actual some of the actual slides, uh, I really need to take a minute and mention regulations and standards. the The list on the screen are some of the most common standards in the grain industry. You'll find these mentioned throughout the presentation. We you know, I really can't discuss all of these in, in detail here, but uh, it's important to note that they all have similar goals, which are to prescribe the minimum requirements for safety to life and property from a fire or explosion, and to minimize the resulting damage if a fire or explosion were to occur. Uh, regulate, regulatory standards are developed by both governments and voluntary industry groups. Groups uh, they they often apply uh, in the United States, in Canada, and many other parts of the world, and and you should become familiar with them. Some of these standards are are international, and some are specific to a certain country. Um, just just for an example, I mentioned Canada previously. Um, in, in Canada, they have the the uh, Canadian Center for Occupational Health and Safety. Which is, you know, roughly the equivalent of, of in the U.S. what we have, we call OSHA. Uh, although there are some some variations, um, <clears throat> Canada has adopted most of the NFPA standards, but they also have their own Canadian Electrical Code. And most of the ASTM standards are are international. They've been adopted and accredited by throughout Canada. You you really uh, need to learn. And what your country standards are, and more like local, state, uh, provincial, or local adopted codes and standards are, because they may be actually be more restrictive than than uh, so, so some of the national standards. So it's really up to you as as the uh, as the owner, as the operator, to to learn what what your standards are. There's a few other uh, standards that, that apply. I, th I think most of you have, are familiar with the National Fire Prevention Association, the NFPA, and uh, they, have, uh, they have a whole series of codes. Several uh, apply to the uh, grain handling industry. OK, so uh, this lecture, this part four of the course, so what are, what are our goals? What are we trying to accomplish here today? Um, this part of the course will is meant to help you recognize the causes or conditions that could lead to the development of a fire or a smolder in your in your grain silo or bin. These causes and conditions they could include grain quality management problems, mechanical causes, electrical causes, or other miscellaneous causes. And I, I just listed a few of them here, such as hot work, combustible materials, light 
lightning, uh, et cetera. Um, in addition to uh, describing each of these causes or conditions, we'll also look at detection or prevention technologies that are available. And so, you know, what are we trying to detect? Mainly, we're looking for improper operating conditions, high temperatures, anything that will alert the plant operator to abnormal conditions. So let's get started. First, let's talk about grain quality management problems. How can spoiled grain result in a smolder or a fire? Grain is not an inert material like, like an aggregate or a sand. Stored grain will change both chemically and physically over time. It's, it's just changing all the time. If grain is not properly managed during storage, it will pre begin to spoil or ferment. And when I mentioned fermentation is, is really, fermentation is a chemical transformation of, of organic substances you know, such as grains into simpler compounds and is triggered by microorganisms such as molds, yeast, bacteria, etc. Fermentation is also an exothermic reaction, which means it gives off heat. And heat, oxygen, and fuel, in this case the fuels, the stored grain, can result in a smolder or a fire. What's shown on the screen is uh, called the fire tetrahedron, tetrahedron, and it's really showing the four elements of a fire, uh, what, what you need, need for a fire, which is uh, heat, oxygen, fuel, and a chemical chain reaction. Fires don't occur with, without, without all four of these elements. So you take one away and, and the fire goes away. When we talk about grain quality management, we're referring to how grains are handled as they move throughout your facility. So from, from incoming, from, the, from when the truck or vessel arrives on your site, through storage, and until you load it out. Some of the key topics in grain quality management include sampling, drying, aerating or cooling grain, storability to prevent spoilage, and insect or pest control. Uh, grain quality management is a very deep subject. There's, uh, there's actually a, a very good course that Jeeps offers, which is, uh, I believe it's Jeeps 520 Grain Quality Management, and that addresses all of these topics that I just mentioned in greater detail. For this lecture, we're going to just focus a bit on storability, particularly grain storage as it can lead to smolders and fires inside grain silos. There are four main conditions that will negatively impact storability and lead to spoilage. First, there's initial poor initial grain quality. Uh, so it's you know keep in mind that the condition of grain is not going to improve during storage. You know the best you can do is try to maintain the initial quality. You're, it's you're just storing it; it's not going to get any better. Another uh, negative impact to storability is high moisture or wet grains. High moisture levels in storage, that either internal grain moisture or condensation or leaky bins, can lead to mold formation and hot spots to develop in your bin. Another factor that will negatively impact storability is storing grains at high temperatures. Mold growth and insect activity increase with higher temperatures. And moisture migration inside a bin will also occur if the grain temperature isn't kept uniform. It'll move from hot to cold and vice versa, and you'll get condensation, um, which will all, always uh, negatively impact storability. And the, and the fourth uh, item that negatively impacts storability is insect inf infestations. Uh, in, insects also generate moisture. So increased grain moisture, uh, increased insect activity can lead to mold and increased temperatures, which uh, all, always accelerate uh, insect uh, reproduction and the cycle just repeats itself and, and you, you end up with a, a, a problem inside your bin. <clears throat> 
So we know that we know the conditions that can result in spoiled grain fermentation and fires or smolders, but, but what methods are available to preserve grain or prevent these problems? So I mentioned at the beginning of the course, we're going to talk about what the problems are, but also how, how what can we do to detect them or 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 uh, alert them, alert us to a problem. So this is this is one of those. So how do we uh, how do we monitor our grain as it's being stored? The main grain conditioning tools we have are drying. So that's drying is a, a process to lower the moisture content of grain to a, a safe level for storage. We have aeration, which is a process used to control grain temperature by by forcing air through the grain. Aeration will both will cool the grain uh, and maintain a uniform temperature throughout the bin, both of which will help stop or slow mold growth and also slow uh, insect activity. Screening or cleaning is another method. Um, broken kernels and other other fine materials will help promote mold growth and insect activity. In addition to reducing your drying and aeration efficiency, so uh, you know broken kernels and damaged material is uh, presents problems throughout. And depending on the crop condition of, of you know that season, an elevator operator may want to screen or clean the grain prior to storage. It it's a seasonal thing. It it, it kind of depends on the on the crop conditions seasonal and both geographic another method uh, used for grain conditioning is fumigation which is a, uh, a method to kill insects using a, a, a gas like a phosphine gas uh, generally it's only used when storing grain for longer than uh, maybe a, a year you know long longer term storage um, be aware that fumigants are harmful to humans so you really need to you need to see professional assistance before you know pursuing this method you need you need to be qualified and, and understand what the risks are another another uh, means to deal with grain conditions uh, is coring or turning a bin so uh, you know what that means is fine materials uh, are often will build up in, in the center of a bin during filling um, the fines uh, increase resistance to airflow and so they'll be your aeration will be less effective uh, in that in that zone where uh, there's a lot of fines. So coring is just a process of, of transferring these fines to another bin or maybe loading it out onto a truck or you know generally uh, trying to get rid of that core area of uh, high high fines. I, you know, I mentioned there's just an enormous amount of information around uh, grain quality management and grain conditioning um, you know more than we really could cover over here this afternoon, there is a uh, an, another Jeep's education course, distance education course. In fact, there's two of them that that are very good with uh, delving in, into the details, and that would be Jeep's 521, which is the aeration system design program, and uh, 524, which is grain drying. Uh, rule of thumb um, for you for for uh, grain conditioning and around mold and insect activity. Mold and in insect activity is generally greatly reduced when the temperature of the grain is below about 55 degrees or you know 12.8 uh, Celsius and 15% moisture content. Um, you should you know you should look reference look at your reference material for specific grains and geographic locations but as a rule of thumb you get it below 55 and 15 percent and um, generally your your mold growth and insect activity is slowed okay so monitoring grain conditions inside your bins or silos uh, will allow you to take actions prior to a fire or smolder developing um, and it, it's it's a very handy tool. So you have you have a bin full of grain. And how do you know what's going on inside there? Um, there's there's a few different techniques available. There's of course there's just the the human uh, sense of smell uh, with with aeration fans running. And if you know a skilled and experienced uh, elevator operator can notice a musty or sour odor, uh, you know coming out of the fans, and um, you know they'll know that. They may have a 
problem with the grain and they maybe need to move it around. Um, so sense of smell is always out there. Temperature cables are really common. Temperature cables are suspended from the roof of a bin and extend all the way down to the all the way down to the bin floor. So through the entire grain depth. The temperature cables are connected to a plant automation system and are used to monitor the temperature of the stored grain uh, along the entire length of the cable, and then they can alert the operator to any hot spots that that may be developing. Um, you can you can see in the slide here that the red area indicates a what would be a hot spot and a uh, um, temperature control temperature cable system could could tell the operator where approximately they have a hot spot at. Uh, recently, uh, sensors have been added to temperature cables that can monitor relative humidity, which is you know moisture levels uh, inside a bin, and, and alert the operator if uh, excessive moisture uh, exists. And I, I mentioned moisture's moisture's an enemy; uh, it will it will promote mold and fermentation. So, uh, mo relative humidity sensors are a tool that could be used. Another method to detect uh, fermenting or spoiling grain is to install CO2 detectors inside the bin. One, one of the products of fermentation, of course, is CO2. So uh, if you can monitor the CO2 and you, you notice increasing levels of CO2, it's an early warning sign that, that a problem may, developing, may be developing inside the bin. In addition, all, these, all of these Techniques could also be used to automatically control aeration fans. Okay, so we'll move on to uh, the next cause or condition uh, that can lead to a fire or, or smolder in a bin, and that is mechanical malfunctions. Some of the very common mechanical causes that that could lead to a bin smolder fire are bearing failures, bearing failures, which is really what you're looking for is heat generated from from friction, trap pockets of grain, uh, block spouts or built up material, uh, tramp metal that's caught up in your in your grain grain stream, the use of flammable or combustible materials or materials that have an improper fire resistance rating. And we'll we'll talk about con conveyor belts here in a little bit. Um, belt or pulling missile belt or pulley misalignment, which uh, is um, again results in rubs and heat from friction. Keep in mind what we're really concerned with here is high temperatures, sparks, and any kind of hot material that could enter a silo, which could lead either to a bin fire or or even a dust explosion. So we'll just run through each of these uh, in order. So first would be bearing failures. In a grain elevator, uh, we, you, we can have hundreds or even thousands of bearings. And there, there are several reasons why a bearing will fail. It could be um, improper lubrication. Maybe the, maybe the wrong grease was used, maybe too little grease, maybe too much grease. Excessive loads due to either improper bearing selection or a change in operating conditions. Improper installation, could be misalignment of the bearing and the shaft, a loose fit or a tight fit. Contaminants, which uh, contaminated grease or water, air, airborne dust, uh, defective seals, uh, getting uh, contaminants into the bearing, causing them to fail. Or corrosion, which would be exposing bearings to a corrosive fluid or an atmosphere, maybe not as much in, in a grain elevator. I would say probably the contaminants are more, uh, contaminants or improper lubrication are more more common there. When a bearing starts to fail, it will generate heat and high temperatures very quickly. In high temperatures, sparks or hot material, obviously we need to avoid those at grain handling facilities. Uh, they can they could lead to a dust explosion and or and or a fire. Let me share an example with you. Here's a uh, here's a simpler uh, simple bearing, uh, and you can tell that 
<clears throat> this was a failed bearing. You can, see, you can see the hot spot near the bottom of the picture there, that black spot. This was most likely, uh, this most likely failed because it was either it wasn't lubricated or contaminants, you know, dust or dirt got past the seal and got into the bearing. And so maybe this doesn't look, you know, on, on the outside, this doesn't look very concerning. Um, you know, big deal, we replaced the bearing. Um, but, you know, let's, let's take a look at the next slide and let's dig, dig a little bit deeper into this. Okay, this is the same example as I shared before, but this is from inside the conveyor. So you're looking at the uh, tail pulley and you're looking at the belt. What we couldn't see on the previous slide is that hot material actually got into the conveyor and charred the belt. And you can see that's the red, the red picture that inside that circle or that oval is uh, charred, charred belt material. So that's just an example where you know failed bearing doesn't look that bad, but you know it led led to a, uh, a you know some burning inside the conveyor. In this case, there wasn't a catastrophe, but it but there was definitely a smolder inside here. Okay, so selection of the bearings. There are, there are different types of bearings, and some bearings offer better protection against. Uh, failure or better protection against hot materials and high temperatures e even if the bearing fails. So this this photo shows you know both a pillow block and a, and a flange style bearing and, and you can see the pillow block bearing on the left there is a, an air gap between the equipment and the bearing and on the other hand a flange bearing is bolted directly directly to the equipment without without an air gap. So with a with a pillow block style there's less there's somewhat less potential for hot material to enter the equipment because of that that air gap and so less less uh, potential for uh, fire or smolder um, flange bearings are commonly used so some some users for flange bearings have put a, a, a non-metallic spacer between the bearing and the equipment just like I uh, like I'm showing in the picture here the lower right hand corner it's it's maybe not as effective as an air gap, but it does insulate the equipment from potential higher temperatures, and and also uh, makes it less likely uh, you know, provides a path for hot material to fall outside of the conveyor rather than than inside the conveyor. Um, I'm not recommending that we you know we should all avoid flange bearings because they're they're there's great applications for them. It's just this just meant to point out that. Uh, what you select, the type of bearing you select, it does does play a part in in reducing your risk from a from a fire or smolder developing. So when we get into the detection piece on bearings, uh, use of bearing temperature sensors is a preventative method to detect bearing failures as they occur. I mentioned they they heat up real quick. A, a failed bearing is going to heat up real fast when. Uh, when the shaft's rotating, uh, so a, a temperature sensor in the bearing can can pick up that temperature. This this uh, illustration, uh, this photo sh shows uh, one type of bearing sensor where a, a thermal couple is inserted into this greaser port of the bearing. If and if the bearing fails, the thermal couple can sense a, a, a rise in temperature very quickly and, and can alert the operator and, or shut the equipment down automatically, uh, depending on what you want to do with your your control system. Uh, the NFPA 61 document actually requires bearing sensors on the head and tail shafts of all conveyor belts and legs. Uh, in addition, owners or operators should perform their own uh, economic uh, and risk analysis to determine if they want sensors in other areas. Another detect another uh, area where a uh, that could contribute to a smolder or fire is any area where grain or dust could be collect and become trapped. So in, in this example, it's a, a belt conveyor with an enclosed snub pulley, and you can see where I've got the big red arrow pointing towards. That could be an area, a pocket where dust 
or grain can become trapped. And, and keep in mind that that snub pulley, uh, the, the purpose, it, it serves a purpose to increase the, the wrap angle on the head pulley and gives you better traction for your belt. So sometimes you need those. Um, but if you're in a, if you got an enclosed one like this illustration and indicates, um, that snub pulley is always rotating and if you get enough material trapped and packed in there, it, it could heat up due to friction. There are ways to eliminate that risk and, and here's here's one way uh, is uh, to actually just open up the uh, discharge chute, um, enlarge it so it doesn't just include the head pulley, it includes the whole snub pulley and you can see there's a, a large discharge hopper underneath. So any any material that kind of gets carried over the head pulley and around that snub pulley is going to fall out and you don't have any trap material anymore. And th this is the kind of stuff that, that uh, you know, owners, operators, uh, equipment OEMs and engineers, uh, we really have to challenge ourselves on this on a daily basis and look, look for these types of little things that, that can improve our, uh, our industry and keep us safe. Another example uh, of trap material could be plug spouts. So uh, a, pl a plug spout, in this case on this on this belt conveyor, if the uh, discharge chute was plugged, grain could back up into the conveyor. Uh, of course, the uh, conveyor would keep running, uh, the pulley would keep spinning, and you know, just via friction, you could you could heat things up, heat that grain up, and start a fire. So uh, a means to uh, prevent this from happening would be to put a, uh, a electronic plug switch in the in the spout which I, I show on the lower right hand corner so as that uh, what would happen is as that spout fills up with grain when it gets plugged that it would it would trip that switch and then the uh, the equipment could either shut down or the or the uh, operator could get uh, an alarm or both depends on how you set your your um, control system up. There are uh, several different types of plug switches. I just threw a couple common ones here. Um, there's uh, there's mechanical and just uh, fully electronic proximity types. Um, they're generally uh, placed in discharge spouts of bucket elevators and belt conveyors to detect that uh, green has stopped flowing and then uh, you, you're, you've got a, something's plugged up downstream and you can stop your equipment. Okay, we'll move forward. There are many materials uh, in a grain facility or combustible. Uh, these, mo these materials by themselves won't necessarily be the root cause of a fire or smolder, but they, they could become a fuel source if, if they get ignited. And I'll discuss two examples here in this section. One, one will be uh, conveyor belting and the other one will be wear liners for spouting. Okay, materials may have diff different fire resistant properties and conveyor belting uh, provides us a very good example. Uh, there, there's an acronym in the uh, conveyor belting industry called SCOF or S-C-O-F uh, and it, it's, it's something you should remember, it's an acronym you should remember when discussing belting and, and comparing one belt material to another. So the, the acronym SCOF stands for Static Conductive Oil Resistant fire resistant. So keep in mind our, our concern for this, this course is keeping hot or burning material out of storage silos. With that in mind, fire or flame resistance is the key property that to be aware of with conveyor belting. And I, don't, I, I know all of you know that grain, grain facilities will use thousands of feet of rubber conveyor belting. So this isn't, this isn't a minor item, this is a big item for us to, to keep in mind. And belting is a rubber compound. It's it will burn when exposed to flame. A a, a true fireproof belt cannot be made. However, conveyor belts they can be formulated uh, in, in process. So so when they are made, they're fire or flame resistant. And by flame resistant, that simply means the belting will self extinguish or it'll stop burning once a flame source is removed. So if you stuck a, a torch on a on a on a scoff belt, 
with the with the proper rating and you, and you took it away the the fire would should just extinguish itself so the yeah, fire resistant is is the key term here for for grain facilities other belt construction properties are oil resistance and static conductive or sometimes called surface resist resistivity so the oil resistance is uh, is, an, is another important concept and oil seeds that, that we occasionally handle like canola or soybeans or dust suppression sprays such as a mineral oil can be damaging to some types of, of rubber belts so it's important to consider uh, your, your oil resistant uh, rating when you're specifying or purchasing a conveyor belt it just it'll, it'll last longer Static conductive is another another consideration that I don't think we often think about. It's it's believed that the heat from a static spark could be enough to ignite a dust cloud, uh, such as you might find inside a conveyor housing. Um, static electricity is generated and, and, and accumulates in belt conveyors uh, in a, in a few different ways. It could be the belt turning around the pulley, uh, the belt sliding across the bottom housing of the conveyor. Um, even even grain sliding down a uh, you know a spout lined with with urethane could could build up a static charge. Um, <clears throat> so as a precaution, uh, conveyor belting can be formulated using static uh, dissipative materials. So remember today, if you don't remember anything else today, remember uh, the SCOF acronym for your conveyor belting. Let me just show you an example. Here's here's an example where a, a, a small smolder in a, in a conveyor uh, resulted in a, in a rather large fire, and actually you can see it destroyed the conveyor. Um, <clears throat> so during the post-fire investigation, it was discovered that the the original conveyor belt, which is it was properly rated, it was fine, um, had been replaced with with one having an improper uh, flame resistance rating. Um, I, I don't know, I, you know, I don't know why it was like that, but it was wasn't a good decision, and it got installed in this conveyor, so it definitely contributed to the severity of this fire. Because, like I mentioned before, if, uh, it, it may have self-extinguished, um, but obviously this didn't, and it destroyed the conveyor. So this is a good example where uh, improper rating on a material had a uh, rather dramatic result. And these SCOF ratings that, that I've been talking about are not just recommendations. They're, they're actually requirements that are found in various codes and standards that, that govern our grain industry. Um, let's, let's just take a look at a couple of them. So the, the OSHA 1910-272 uh, OSHA uh, requirement for grain handling facilities says that all belts and lagging shall have a surface electrical resistance not to exceed 300 mega ohms. Uh, NFPA 61. Um, says all belting and lagging shall have a surface resistivity not greater than 100 mega ohms per square and be fire and oil resistant. Um, the Canadian Standard Association, CSA, um, has fire performance and anti-static requirements for conveyor belting. Uh, ISO 284 also has uh, requirements for conveyor belting. Um, it's uh, and you can read all of these uh, in in detail. I, can, I don't really have the time to go into them uh, today, um, but just keep in mind they do exist. And, and the other thing to to keep in mind here is that I, I, I'm showing four different codes or standards on the screen. The the codes don't always 100% agree with each other, and and this isn't uncommon because there really isn't a such a thing as a universal code for everything. I think there's differences. And so it's it's uh, your uh, your uh, responsibility as an owner or an operator or a user, you know, to follow the requirements for your your specific country or region. Okay, and I'll close out this the discussion here on conveyor belting. Is uh, you know how do you determine if your conveyor belt has the proper scoff rating? You know how do you know? <clears throat> so. For sure, you can ask your belting supplier, and you you can also look for the paperwork you ordered when the you know when the when the belt was ordered. If you know if you could find the paperwork, um, an easier way maybe just to look at the belt itself. Um, most belt OEMs will have their their name 
and other info, including the brand name of the belt and material spec, uh, stamped directly on the belt, roughly every 60 feet of length in the belt. Um, so if you uh, look at look at your belting, uh, you'll you'll find this. And here's a couple examples uh, from some different manufacturers. Okay, there's another another uh, where you may have a, a flammable or combustible material is is wear lining of spouts or, or equipment um, <clears throat> you know we, we all know that whole grains uh, grains abrasive and it'll erode steel over time um, you know nearly all spouting and transitions will have some kind of a wear liner to pr prolong the life of a spout um, wear liners are can include abrasion resistant steel ceramic tile and and other you know polymers such as UHMW or urethanes um, the AR steel and ceramic, you know, obviously won't burn, but they're, you know, generally a little bit more expensive. Um, there's many polymer or plastic linings available. Um, however, uh, many of those are combustible. There's there are some available that that resist flame propagation, um, but most of the the just there's the normal stuff is combustible. So NFPA prefers that non-combustible liners are used, but doesn't doesn't prohibit the use of them. That's in the NFPA 61 code. You just have to be aware where you have these these liners at, and and watch uh, when you're doing any maintenance activity or, or otherwise. I'll show you a a, a small example here. A um, little bit difficult to see in the pictures, but you can see there's a bunch of uh, debris here on this, uh, which happens to be a bulk weigh scale. Um, what happened in this case was the, the scale hoppers were lined with urethane, a wear liner, which is real common, um, <clears throat> and usually not a problem. But what was happening there was there was hot work, there was welding taking place above. Sparks got into the scale and and started the wear liner on fire. So this this also we'll talk about hot work here in a, in a little bit, um, but it it kind of illustrates two points is. What, you know, if you're going to use, if you have combustible material, watch, understand what you have, and understand your risks when you're when you're when you're doing work or or otherwise, and and also do some pre-planning when you before you do hot work. couple of uh, other monitoring devices out there. Um, you know, I mentioned plug switches and bearing temperature sensors. Uh, two other types that that, you, that are very common are belt alignment or rub sensors and slow down sensors. Belt alignment or rub sensors are, are used in bucket elevators and belt conveyors and their their purpose is to detect a, a belt misalignment or pulley shift which uh, if when the pulley or the belt shifts it hits the rub sensor and the friction causes a rise in temperature and, and alerts the operator to uh, to an abnormal operating condition. So this is uh, this is a photo of rub sensors installed on a bucket elevator. They're uh, they're the ones that are in circled there. And this is a rather new leg. I'll show you one. Here's one where the uh, rub sensors are not located in the right spot, and you can see where the rubs have actually burned the paint off the off the uh, housing and you can see that in the in the photo in the in the red circles so not only uh, rub sensors are great they have to be in the right spot and you have to make sure they're going to be they're going to be uh, the point of contact first point of contact just something to be aware of slowdowns Sometimes they're called zero speed switches or under speed switches are typically found in the non-driven or tail shaft of a conveyor or bucket elevator and they're they're measuring the actual RPM of the shaft and their purpose is to detect a belt slippage or a broken shaft or uh, other issue and alert the operator because belt slippage can pr produce heat you know through via friction which could lead to a fire or smolder. And this this is an example of a slowdown on a belt conveyor. Okay, we'll move to some of the miscellaneous causes, and that one would be electrical. 
sometimes electrical systems can be a cause of a fire or smolder. In regard to fire started by electrical systems, we mainly are concerned with sparks, arcs, and heated surfaces. The, <clears throat> really, the, the key point to remember for electrical systems in regard to grain elevators is that grain is a combustible dust and requires the use of special wiring methods, materials, enclosures, and equipment that, that are classified for use in, in a hazardous area. Jeeps in K-State has a, an entire course on electrical safety. I think that number is 542. So um, you could, you could uh, go through that course to learn a little bit more. The big thing to remember for, for owner operators is that all electrical work really, it needs to be performed by a licensed electrician and make sure your electrician understands the hazards of combustible dust. Not, not all electricians are equal. They don't all work in grain elevators. So just keep that in mind. So far I've presented the most common causes or conditions that can lead to fires or smolders. In, in addition, there's a few other miscellaneous causes. Um, these are smoking, malfunctioning delivery vehicles, hot work uh, during maintenance or or by outside contractors, um, uh, combustible materials used in structures, and uh, potentially lightning. So smoking, I think, is, is self-explanatory. Um, you know, it, owners of facilities have to decide if they'll allow smoking and establish smoking areas, you know, well outside the facility, and to provide proper receptacles for the uh, for the butts. So I think that's pretty self-explanatory, but um, you, you run across this quite often with, with outside contractors. They're not sure, and um, you find them smoking in a grain elevator. So um, not to be ignored. Malfunctioning vehicles. Um, you know, we, we you get all kinds of vehicles that come in from, from the, uh, the semis the, the front, that come from the farm, delivery trucks, uh, contractors, you can have fuel leaks, backfiring engines, sparks. Um, just don't allow malfunctioning vehicles onto your property. Just be be vigilant, uh, particularly over dump pits that that lead uh, directly in you know directly uh, a direct path into your elevator. It's it's easier said than done, but you have to maintain vigilance. I earlier here in this presentation I showed the aftermath of a of a bulk way scale fire. Uh, this Fire, I, as I pointed out, was the direct result of poorly planned hot work. Uh, the, the risks uh, were not identified and perhaps not even recognized. Um, many construction fires are caused by inadequate hot work controls. <clears throat> In the US, uh, OSHA defines hot work as any work involving electric or gas welding, cutting, brazing, or similar flame producing operations. And uh, OSHA 1910 also uh, covers some of the precautions for hot work operations, including welding, cutting, and brazing. Um, the uh, Canadian Center for Occupational Health and Safety has resources for hot work education and training. Uh, most owners uh, either have a, their own permit system for hot work or use one of the, uh, the OSHA uh, generic forms. Um, and you know, OSHA is usually always the basis. It's really absolutely crucial to train your outside contractors ab about the hazards uh, of combustible dust. Um, many contractors, unless unless they're involved in the grain industry, frequently uh, they they just don't understand the risks of hot work. Um, and and even the contractors that you use every day, they bring new people on and off the job. And a lot of those folks don't don't get the proper training, so it's it's absolutely critical that you you do good hot work planning and really understand your risks. Okay, getting uh, getting closer here to the end, I'll mention quickly leftover construction materials, and and here's a uh, here's a uh, slip form construction. Uh, and obviously, uh, slip form 
Uh, the wood forms are used throughout the uh, construction process and oftentimes when um, the construction is over, uh, some of the formwork gets left inside the silos. Um, it's you know, pretty, pretty common, it's been done that way for many, many years. Uh, over time, you know, some of the wood will, will fall off, it could, could create flow problems, plug up a spout. Um, um, in, in really extreme cases, if there was a fire in the bin, it, you know, that wood could become, could become fuel for the fire. So uh, it, you, you may want to think about having your contractors remove all the wood formwork um, after, after construction. It's, it's possible to do that. Now, it's not easy. There's, there's additional safety risks for the contractors and, and of course, costs to consider. So um, when you're planning your project, uh, pre-planning your projects, slip form projects, talk to your, your slip form contractors about uh, the possibility of removing the wood formwork. And finally, uh, lightning strikes. So lightning strikes could be the root cause of a fire smolder, though it, their lightning protection is typically not required by any building codes. In some geographic areas with frequent lightning strikes, it might be a good idea to install a lightning protection system. Lightning protection systems consist of a network of air terminals, bonding conductors, and ground electrodes, which all work together to provide a, uh, really they're providing a low resistance path to ground from a potential lightning strike. And they're used to prevent or reduce lightning strike damage to structures. Uh, NFPA 780 is a standard for the installation of lightning protection systems, and that describes design methods and components. Uh, there's also a Lightning Protection Institute that can be another source of education. Um, the most noticeable uh, components of a Lightning Protection System that, that you may see are, are the air terminals. So this is a picture of an air terminal on a, on a light fixture, on a light post. Uh, you're usually going to see these in the highest point of a facility. And, and as you can see in this picture, you have the air terminal. It's connected to a grounding conductor, which is uh, pointing to that. Um, down uh, in the lower right-hand corner, and that conductor uh, ultimately leads to ground. Okay, so let's summarize what we discussed uh, in this, this section of the course. Uh, we learned the causes or conditions that lead to the development of fires or smolders in grain bins, and those causes or conditions include grain quality management problems, mechanical causes, electrical causes, and other miscellaneous causes, like I mentioned, uh, hot work, smoking, lightning, etc. In addition, uh, we also reviewed the available detection or prevention technologies. And what are we trying to detect? Again, we're trying to detect mainly improper operating conditions, high temperatures, anything that alerts the plant operator to abnormal conditions. And I want to thank you for uh, attending the seminar today. And I think, uh, Kendall, if we have a couple minutes for questions. Sure. If there's any. Uh, thank you, Bob, for a great presentation today. This concludes the presentation portion of our of our webinar, and we will now begin our Q&A session. If you have not yet submitted your questions, please do so now. OK, Bob, our first question is, uh, can you tell us how many silo fires occur in the industry per, per year due to poor grain quality? Oh, that's a yeah, that's a good question. I, I you know I'm not I'm not I, I'm not really sure. I I would imagine smolders. Uh, there's probably more smolders than there are all out fires. Um, I I don't know of any that are any statistics that are actually kept in the industry. Um, I, I don't think there's really a place to report these. I, I would say uh, there, there's got to be uh, hundreds and hundreds of smolders though every year, hot spots and maybe thousands and probably every year a couple a couple all-out fires. Okay, our next question. Can you discuss the NFPA 652 dust hazard analysis? Yes, so NFPA 652 is is uh, 
the, the latest version has a um, requirement for dust hazard analysis to be performed in plants. And it's, it's a developing topic. And um, I don't have a good ex example with that I can, I don't have a good example handy with me right now. But it is a developing topic where, where owners are going are gonna to be going through their facilities uh, and looking at each, each, you know, each unit operation and uh, coming up with a formal assessment of their, uh, you know, formally assessing their, hazard, their uh, exposure to combustible dusts and their preventive techniques like dust control or suppression systems, uh, so forth. I'm sorry, I, I don't have a great, uh, I don't have a, I, I have some examples, I just don't have them handy with me right now. Okay, our next question, <clears throat> excuse me, is it a good idea or even code to have a lightning rod on a light standard? I don't see any reason why it couldn't be, I don't know of any, I don't know uh, that it's, I don't know there's a code preventing it. It's at a high spot. It's grounded, down, you know, there's a grounding conductor. You must be referring to the picture I showed on the screen. Okay, our next question. So no, I don't, oh. I don't think there's any problem with it, is, would be my answer. Okay. Our next question, have you ever used any type of smoke detection to detect the presence of smolders or incipient fires? No, no. I, <clears throat> most of the time you're looking at, you're trying to detect these uh, grain fires. Um, you know, smoke detectors are fine in an in a office building or an electrical room, and, and yes, they're pretty common there, but in a, in a bin or, or a storage silo, um, mostly you're trying to detect these smolders before they're generating uh, a lot of smoke. So you're looking for high temperature, elevated temperatures, uh, hot spots, stuff like that before, before there's a lot of smoke. So probably when there's smoke, you probably let things go a little bit too long. Okay, our next question. Uh, what means are used to put out a silo fire? <laughs> Yeah, um, that's, uh, you know, in the uh, 546 course that goes into great lengths on different means to put out fires. Um, you, normally there's, there's a couple things you want to do if you, if, you can, if you can get the grain out of the bin, um, that's a great way to do it without moving it through the elevator, of course, if, if you've got an actual fire. Um, you want to get it outside the bin where you can handle it and spread it out and extinguish it. Um, you can you can try to just seal up the bin, keep it, you know, uh, snuff it out, not let any oxygen in. Um, the uh, course will go into using uh, inert gases like uh, CO2 or nitrogen to uh, an inert gas will basically displace oxygen, and um, with, without any oxygen, the, the fire will go out. Um, <clears throat> one one thing you don't want to do is flood your bin with with water. Um, so just turning a hose on and blowing into the bin uh, has been proven not to uh, not to be successful. The, the water might not get down into those real deep seated fires in the middle of a bin. Um, it can also uh, cause the product to, to swell up and damage the bin. Um, so um, there's there's a couple different means uh, to do it, but but a lot of it is uh, getting it out of the bin so you can deal with it, or trying to eliminate or reduce the uh, oxygen level in the bin with, with an inert gas or seal. Okay, that is all the time that we have for questions today. I want to thank everyone for their participation. If your question was not answered, it will be sent forward to our presenter. That is all that we have for today. I want to go ahead and thank our sponsors, M&M Specialty Services and VAA LLC for their support in bringing you today's webinar. I also want to thank Jeeps and our presenter, Bob Horvat, for joining us today.
As a reminder, this webinar has been recorded and it will be available for viewing on graynet.com within 24 hours. All registrants will also receive an email containing a link to the recording. Our next webinar will be on Thursday, March 1st at 10 a.m. Central. The title is Food Safety Modernization or FISMA Regulatory Updates. Our presenter is Dave Fairfield of NGFA. I want to thank you all for attending and wish you all a great day.